Welcome to Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Hello, Otterites. This is episode 185. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. All right, gentlemen, I am once again sitting in the captain's chair because as Martin tells me, we're doing another episode that was my idea. So two in a row. Two in a row. I feel special. You should, sir. So I'm yes. not sure if this is, you know, a punishment or what, but if you bring it up, you're going to be the captain of it. Well, and I think that's fair. I think that's fair. So yeah, we're we doing that. a history episode. I notice Francis is trying to avoid bringing any new ones up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've, I've kind of reached my quota for a little while. Uh, yes, yes, that's fair, too. Uh, so this one is a history episode. As you know, we've got the new format just twice a month. So this first episode of the month can be one of several things. It could be straight history. It could be uh, people you should know, our heroes slash, uh, what do you call it, history's dirtbags? Uh, I called it uh, history's douchebags. Douchebags, yes, yes. Uh, so it could be personalities, historical figures, historical events, uh, philosophers. Uh, it could be just about anything. Cultural history. Cultural history. Yeah, which we probably won't be doing a whole lot of just because... We did it all We've already. done a lot we've of cultural used, stuff. We've used it up. I mean, I'm sure there's more we could do, but it's time for us to give, give that a break. Those were always the harder episodes for me. So I'm... Skip a bit, brother, as they say. Yes, exactly. So this one we're doing on Charlemagne. I'm not sure Charles how we the missed great. this for so long. It's, yeah. 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 Well, well, you know, we've not done a whole lot of true medieval history. Yeah. That's, that's correct. That's it's it's one of the things... We've not bounced this far back very often. We well, went all the way back to Wome and then kind of came back again. Well, we did like a lot of history does. We did Rome up through the fall, and then we skipped right to the middle of, to the Renaissance. Mm-hmm. That's right, and which is bad. We know better. Uh, there's a lot of great history. There's a lot of great stuff that was going on. I hate the term the Dark Ages because I think because a lot of people say, "Well, a thousand years of the Dark Ages." No, there may have been a thousand years of chaos in various places. Mm-hmm. But Europe was a vibrant place in those thousand years. And it just wasn't one. Political entity, right, right. Well, case in point of this of this episode, because yes. this is and, and this there is, is that, that. Well, this actually this is early. This is the first half of the, the what most people would call the Dark Ages. Well, the Middle Ages is more of a, a true term, uh, and those I've I've seen it written where the Dark Ages ends with Charlemagne and the rest yes. of the Middle Ages continues. You could make that case absolutely, absolutely, because this is um, he is that formative, that significant, right, uh, and he is that significant. Uh, because, you know, I like to say the history of Europe is the history of the Habsburgs. Mm-hmm. That is very true. But even before that, the history of Europe begins with Charlemagne. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really does. King of the Franks. He is, he, right, he was the king of the Franks. Yeah. He united Central Europe, uh, you know, from France all the way to, through the Germanies under one political entity. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, which I think what, was the last time France conquered Germany. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. Uh, Emperor of the Romans is what he called himself from 800 forward. Right. That was the establishment of the Holy Roman Empire. That's right. And it was the Holy Roman Empire because he was literally crowned by the Pope. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to beat having church approval at that time. Yeah. So the setting is, of course, Rome has fallen in the West. Yes, but not the East. And so you have the. Tribal kingdoms, I guess you call it. It's not bad. Vandals, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Visigoths. Uh, and all of these other Germanic slash whatever tribes. While well, Rome still exists in the east, mm-hmm. the, what would be the well, Byzantine the, an imperial power exists in the east because well, it is the direct successor to Rome that started in the city of Rome. Correct. So, I mean, the Polit- Roman Empire... Politically so. The, yeah. Well, yes, but I mean, as a political... You can make that argument for any entity that has a capital in one place and moves it to another. I mean, it, you know... It is centered around Constantinople that right. uh, Constantine founded and, and set up as the hub, the, the new capital the, of the empire. Yeah. And then after Constantine, it was... There was a split. There were east-west. They usually tried to... Uh, complement each other. The East was seen as sort of the senior. The West was usually really run by a warlord who would then nominate a puppet emperor and try to get approval by the Eastern court. 
and blah, blah, blah. But eventually they kind of gave up on that. Until the fall. Yeah. Uh, right. Romulus Augustulus is deposed. He's just a little kid. And Odoacer, uh, the Gothic warlord, takes control of Italy and is he sends the Imperial Regalia to Constantinople and kind of he runs Italy. Yeah. But he's trying to do so nominally as a client king of Constantinople. And sort of that sort of situation kind of comes and goes all throughout Europe. Well, it makes some sense, uh, politically speaking, because Constantinople is still extremely powerful. You do not want them as your enemy. Right. So, and, you know, you have to remember that when you think about the, the, the political climate in the entire empire as well as the social uh, setting, mm-hmm. the, the culture, the power, the population uh, is going to be Constantinople and west, or mm-hmm. east of that. Mm-hmm. You know, because you, you've got um, what we would call the Middle East today and what that was. You know, that, you know, at the time of the split, that's where the culture and the power and the history is. Oh, yeah, in the yeah. east. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the barbarians, to use that derogatory term recognized they did not have this cultural background and they wanted it and they took what they could from Rome in the west but ultimately they realized we still need to become civilized and aren't quite very good at it Uh, but they know how to do that and and the successor kingdoms all throughout Europe Frankish kingdoms Gothic kingdoms often adopted Roman law very much so and protected those that were viewed as Roman citizens Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when they would take over somewhere, uh, Roman citizens were often protected under law. Um, but as you churn through this over the next three to four hundred years, Charles the Great, the Frankish king, begins to consolidate these other areas. Right. And, and is merging them into this Carolingian kingdom centered on what would eventually become France. Um, and that leads to the Pope crowning him as Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On Christmas, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I believe it was, yes. Yes, I think so. Uh, yeah, which for all of us with OCD, that round number just sounds so perfect. It does. It's it, Well, you know, there, there's probably no small uh, planning in that significance either. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, right. it, that, that, well, it, it was, it was a, a, a setup to not just confirm a temporal power for the Pope, but also to set Charlemagne up as the legitimate successor then, not just to the West, but to <laughs> both halves of the Empire. Right, right. So, um, they really wanted to view this as putting Rome back together under this great leader, mm-hmm. Charlemagne, uh, right. and, and to, to move Rome forward. That's how strong the memory is even this 300 plus years later. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Rome as a city, uh, you know, it's called the Eternal City for a reason. And, it, you know, even after uh, a few hundred years of not being the world power, it's still right. a phenomenal Everybody remembers city. it, yes. And it remembers, even though at one point the population dwindles down to like 20 or 30,000. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, it, it, all of the wars, all of the, the warlords and all that, they've scattered. Because, you know, when you're invaded that many times, people are going to say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't live here. Yeah. Or they're yeah. going to be taken off as uh, yeah. slaves or whatever. But it still has that history. I mean, you you go there today and you see that history. Uh, it's still there. Yeah. And so it's just, you know, that kind of, of pull. Yeah. on the imagination is huge and it cannot yeah. be just minimized. Yeah, the power of the words Roman Emperor. Is, right. I mean, it was that much of a thing and they wanted to really, you know, etch that in stone. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, you look at a similar thing with Egypt. Obviously, the Egypt of today has absolutely no relation as a political entity right. to Egypt of ancient days. Mm-hmm. But there's power in a name. Yeah. And, you know, 
to, to them and to many, yeah. it, they get a lot of cachet from being called Egypt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is fine. They should be. That is the, the, the territory. That, that, yeah. That's fine. I don't have a problem with the name, but, I'm, you, know, but you have to recognize that. And again, you see that history. There was a, re- a reason that the Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt still wanted to be called Pharaoh. Yes. Even though they didn't really have any relations. They were Greeks. Yeah. yeah, they were Greeks. That's right. Yeah. So. so yeah, it's you know there is power in history and a name. Obviously, we know there's power in history. That's kind of the point of these episodes. Yep. Um, but Charlemagne is a great historical figure for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, you've got the uh, the military greatness because he manages to unite under one banner. Granted, you know that involves a lot of war and death and what have you. But it's, historically speaking, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff there because what comes out of all of that badness is a great thing. Mm-hmm. He stacked a lot of bodies. He did. Anybody who was a king who who expanded their kingdom did that. Well, that's I don't want to minimize that because that he he just he was not a he did not unite Europe completely under the point of the sword. He didn't. It is not like you go. It's not like Napoleon who basically you will right. do it my way and here's my troops to pr- prove it. He made them because of who he was. He made them want to be part of this entity yes. because yes. he also brought not just troops that you have to house, or but he also brought uh, Christianity with them, which people begin to find, oh, this is better than human sacrifice. Oh, I can see the values yeah, yeah, that's of that. something we often forget. Education the is another Germanys, one. The Germanies, especially the northern Germanies, are not Christian yet. Yeah, that's correct. Still pagan. Yeah, even though we think of Europe by, by this time... Mm-hmm. You know that wherever the, the right. original Roman Empire was is has become Christian. It's like no, that's not really true. Right. That's right. right. Saxony has not become that yet. Right. Uh, much less all that which we call Danelands. You know. Right. Oh, those are all pagan up through there. Although, and he, although Charlemagne does convert Saxony. Right. Uh, and again, through, the, the Gothic kingdoms, the Frankish kingdoms, they were Christian, not necessarily Catholic. Well, Arianism is still a part of this equation. Oh, well, okay. Well, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, Arianism is a big thing in the Germans. But he is great. Catholic. Yeah, orthodoxly yes. Catholic, which orthodoxy. I know that sounds... I don't yes. mean that as in capital O. But that, I mean that, that was a big conflict. In he, was in, he was Rome. in communion with Rome yeah. and the Roman Catholic right. Church. Well, but at the time... It wasn't the Roman Catholic. I know. I'm trying. I'm trying to put it in right. Words right. That it, we but use. By, it, well, well, I think that's because enough say he is in communion with with the Pope, uh, whereas a lot like the uh, Arians are not right. going to be. The Nestorians right. in the East are not going to be in right. communion yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, with so, the Visigoths, were all the Arians. Were that's Arians. right. But yes. he's the Frankish king. He's subsuming these other, and they are now moving away from Arianism. He's unifying the continent. Politically and religiously. Correct. Yes. Exactly right. Now, uh, and, and that's, that's a huge it is, it's a huge thing. piece. That's yeah. right. And again, like you said, it's yes, he's advancing Christianity at the point of the sword somewhat, but not not really. No, I mean, yeah. People are like, yeah. well, hey, this guy's got it going on. Let's join up. That's ultimately that's exactly it, because we do not want to paint him. He is not a Bonaparte. Which was exactly that's exactly that's exactly there's the, the difference. Point. There yeah, because is a difference. Nobody Napoleon was entirely forced conquering. Correct, and this is not. This is uh, there's a little of that. There's going to be some of it, absolutely. Because there, you know, there are dissenters and those who are, who would get their to use the metaphor, well, get their oxes gored, lose their power. But he was very good at putting those people back in place, saying, you know, be part of me. Right. We, we, you know, we, you know how to run the place. That, that is how a successful empire expands. That's ultimately. exactly right. Well, that's how Rome did it originally. Mm-hmm. Yes, they would go in and conquer, but it's like, okay, well, you guys are part of us now. So you're doing a real good job running this town before. You're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Just send us the taxes. Send us the taxes. Take your religion, whatever. Yeah. And you know, the, be, the, the, be the properly homogeneous. obsequious to the to the to the uh, emperor, and yeah. we'll be fine. Mm-hmm. The homogeneity then became or more organic. Yeah. You, Rome, you wanted to do things Rome's way because it worked. Right. And we're going to leave this garrison of soldiers here. Yes, that's partially to keep you in line, but it's also partially to help Romanize you. Yeah. And, and, protect, and, you and protect you. And protect outside. you from, that's right, from your neighbors. And that, you see, that's all that's of a sudden. No small thing. That's no small thing. That's right. You know, because we're not, going to, we're not going to rape and pillage you. We're actually going to work with you. Right. And, uh, and, and because they will. Went in the same direction. That's it's, correct. It's very yeah, much a Roman existence. But I'm going to protect you now from. 
Right. Everybody wants the, that goal of golden centuries of peace, as they said in the movies, of the Pax Romana. Yes. And that was very much part of Charlemagne's modus operandi. Right. right. And this is, with Charlemagne, this is the beginning of the golden age of Christendom. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can't be understated either. Uh, yes, there's always going to be wars in Europe. Um, yeah, the, the last 75 years is, a, is an anomaly. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the fact that there's not been a shoot. Well, I, technically, do we call the Ukraine part of Europe or then on the right side of the Urals to technically be Europe? Yeah, I mean, I mean, technically, I think you'd have to say yes, there's been two wars in Europe since 1945. Because there's the dissolution of Yugoslavia. Yes. And now Ukraine. Right. Those are very localized. Wars and they were nearly, especially Yugoslavia. That was effectively that was a civil war because yeah. it was a a, a a a artificial state from the very beginning, and you know it's so, so it, it was, was almost destined a Serbian creation that the Croatians and Bosnians didn't want anything to do with. Right, right, and once you have the uh, the overlord gone, Marshal Tito in particular, but communism in general. Uh, yes. Then all of a sudden, all that changes. Gonna break loose. I have to give my favorite anecdote on Marshall Tito, though. If you if you if you bear in mind with me, and you probably know the story, because Stalin sent assassins after him on a regular basis in the fifties, and and finally he Tito had enough. He sends back a message to Stalin, which has become part of history, saying, "Thank you for sending all these assassins. Uh, if I if you do this again, I'm going to send one after you, but I'll only need one." <laughs> Uh, and it stopped. So, you know, if somebody that can take down Stalin... Hey. Yeah, one of the rare people that was more ruthless and effective than Stalin. Very much so, yes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, he was probably a little more sophisticated than Stalin. In that oh, Tino yeah, was... Yeah. He, he's a very interesting character, uh, yeah. if, if you study him a but, lot. Anyways, go back to the point, though. There's, there's very rarely this much peace in Europe as a whole. Because, again, those two wars are very, very localized. Uh, and at the time... You know, during the so-called the part that I'm willing to call the Dark Ages, from yeah. the fall up to the establishment of the Holy Roman Empire, you've got uh, what were large regions in the empire that are now devolved into essentially, especially in Italy, city states. Yeah, you know, loosely feudal. Loosely feudal. Uh, sometimes they are very sophisticated. You know, when you get to uh, 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 to some of the ones in the north, the ones that are especially... Lombardy and Tuscany in particular. Yes. Very and, much know, so. Uh, and you, you get to uh, uh, ones that, you know, like Florence that is very much in a, in a city-state that is very powerful. Correct. Uh, in and of itself, you get uh, the ones that are uh, sea powers that manage to... to Venice. Yes, Venice especially. Particular. You know, they are ones that are going to be able to, to maintain that. Yeah. But they don't necessarily spread much beyond their cities. You know, they have influence, yeah. but it's not like you know a conquering army comes yeah. in. Politically and, speaking, they have limits. Right. right. And, uh, and some of that's trade-related, yeah. but yes. some of it is simple geography and technology. Exactly. Yeah. And, that's, and of course, you know, as we've talked before, the Alps are a great buffer to the rest of Europe, uh, which is why I think the, uh, the papal states, that and the fact that the Charlemagne wanted the Pope to approve, that the rest of Italy did not become part of the Holy Roman Empire. Well, that's true because he wanted again. He wanted the Pope to be able to be somewhat uh, independent. But what if he well, first Pope wanted to be independent? Yes, he yeah, did. That's the important uh, part. Uh, they that was wanted this, uh, they wanted Italy aligned with the Empire. Yes, the Pope wanted his power. They also wanted to use this then to play these other powers off of each other. Yeah, yeah, if one, one person controlled it, then you yeah. become a puppet, and then you lose your influence. Yeah. So there's yeah. the Norman kingdoms in the south, Lombardy in the north. They Lombardy, and, all these off each other. those are the first ones that Charlemagne basically picks off. Yeah, because, because Lombardy, the Lombards and the, and the Tuscans, they wanted Rome. They wanted the Pope. They, they tried, and they sent to Charlemagne and say, you know, hey... You know, you're a good Catholic. We're kind of in trouble over here. And Charlemagne said, okay, I'll do that. And he did. And it, most conquerors, and this is his genius, would have said, okay, but now I'm your guy. I'm your overlord. He says, no, 
You're going to stay independent. We'll be friends. We'll be allies. I will protect you. Yes, that is something we cannot underestimate. That's right. As far as the influence of that's, that's his genius. The genius of leaving the papal states alone uh-huh. uh, cannot be understated. Not just for the church, but for himself. Right. Because that also gives him the legitimacy of being crowned by the Pope. And it leaves the Pope independent, uh-huh. unlike what we see in the East, where right. the... Uh, patriarchs are beholden to the state. Right. right. And that's important. There was a time, point in time where it was very important for the, the church to also be a political entity. But by the time Vatican I comes along, when uh, you know Italy is united again yeah. as a single entity, uh, it was very important that the church relinquish its secular ruling Correct. ability because now it has even more influence. Correct, and it's and it's not necessary and it's not for necessary survival. Anymore. Unlike during the time of Julius, where who called him the warrior pope, uh, he was literally fighting for the survival of of the papal states uh, as an as an entity. And ultimately, of the church as an independent entity. Correct. Correct. The Spanish Otherwise, had huge designs on capturing the papacy and making it uh, subservient to Spain. Right. That was the goal, mm-hmm. and you know. As long as they had gold coming from the New World, that was the you know. What it was, was a going sustainable on. thing. Yeah, because there was lots of wars in Italy between the Spanish and yeah. uh, the Papal States. And of course, this devolves into the wars of religion eventually. Eventually, uh, yeah. and about a hundred years after that, they they split into two camps, and you know. Yeah. So, so there's some leverage going on too, because yes, uh, it gives the Pope if he's still independent, it gives him some leverage. That he can excommunicate or interdict, which were very powerful weapons at the time. Absolutely. That's right. uh, and, okay, you, you don't like Charlemagne? Fine. Interdiction. That's right. And then suddenly your town, your state is cut off from other Catholics. Right. And, the and, sac- so and well, the you, sacraments, too. Yeah, I mean, which is very much. Get in line and. Yeah, and the, the beauty of the independence of that is that was not something that was wielded as a in a puppet like fashion against Charlemagne's enemies. He himself was subject to it at times, right? And it wasn't wielded as, as a bludgeon. It was people. it was meant as a corrective, like right. you know, we're all supposed yeah. to get along. We're yes, all Christians. Yes, and you know, I'm I'm freely willing to admit that yes, there are times when it was used as a blunt instrument. Sure, but that was not always the case. Uh, I'd say it was probably less the case than than. So well, it, it was, it was Henry the Fourth, uh, Charlemagne's uh, yeah. successor, uh, one of the Habsburgs, he, he got smacked pretty hard several times. Yes. And uh, Philip the Fair of the French, well, with the Templars and all yeah, as we've we discussed. Do a whole episode on the investiture controversy someday, yeah. right? Yeah, so, so that, that's kind of the background. There's, there's, you know, the the king of the Franks. So he's got basically what's France. Yeah, uh, and he's looking to unite the rest of Europe effectively, and. You know, it's it would be like as if every city in, in along the eastern seaboard was its own independent state, and the revolution was to unite all of them, as opposed to thirteen colonies, which would have been much, which was obviously much easier. Uh, so the task was huge. Yeah, because the yeah, been. because most of these. You're, I'm glad you mentioned that because these are not states that we are today. They are right. cities and regions right. and, that and have we, their own culture and sometimes language and yes, customs. Especially the Germanies. You know, That's there right. wasn't a German language. There still isn't a German language. It's far more uniform than than it was. Right. Uh, and probably you know the German that you are taught in school is probably ninety five percent of what they're going to speak well, it's, over there. It's Prussia. Yeah. But. You know, at Which one became time, the dominant force. there were so many different dialects of German that if you went more than 100 miles in any direction, you probably couldn't understand everybody. Mm-hmm. But it was kind of that, you know, it flowed and, and slowly morphed the farther away you get from this point to this point. Um, so, yeah, that, it's an incredibly difficult task he's got in front of him. On the other hand, it would have been also very easy because of that, because nobody had a huge army. So right. uh, having the ability to... Uh, put enough men into the field mm-hmm. to be able to do this uh, like the Romans did. Because, I mean, think about what he did. He did it faster than Rome did. And by there, far. Were, there were enemies to fend off as well. And there, there, there were, were enemies. Places, places, places sought out the protection of Charlemagne. Right. Uh, the Vikings, uh, not least of which. Because so, yeah. he's not, he's temperamentally, he's not a conqueror. 
And I think we 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 don't want to slide over that too much. We've talked a little bit about it. That's he's he's helped to, he's helping to civilize with a goal to bring about this Christendom. Right. But he is not, he is, does not do he's no Bonaparte as we've said. He does not do this for glory or for conquest. He wants everybody to succeed. Which is very egalitarian in many ways. Uh and um, forward thinking. Well, I mean, you know, but at the same time he's an excellent politician. Oh, he understands I mean, differences. He, well, he's, he's, he can be ruthless too. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, Saxony is a great example. You are now Christian or die. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it being it was being Christian upon penalty of death. Literally. That's correct. Yeah, he so he, he will put up with so much shit only so long. Only so long. That's right. Uh, and of course, you know, being the king of the Franks, because you know he was king of the Franks uh, for thir- over thirty years before he became Holy Roman Emperor. Mm-hmm. And part of what he had to deal with was, thank God, he had the Pyrenees because he was fending off the Moors yeah. in Spain. You remember, at this time, Spain is conquered by. Uh, yes. Muslim army. Al Andalus is yeah. essentially in place. Uh, only the Basques in the region of the Pyrenees itself are quasi independent. In fact, yeah. so much of the genius, the story of the Song of Roland, is about that. Yeah. Is about him attempt his moving in to try and bring back a little Christianity to uh, those northern areas, which of course does not succeed well. Yeah, the Vandal Kingdom of Spain in North Africa is gone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's, it's Al Andalus uh, in only two hundred years. Yeah, very the, quickly. The Muslims it, have conquered, uh, boom, like everything. Yeah, so. yeah, everything that was not continental Europe that was the known world at the time, basically. Yeah, they were basically stopped on two points: one in the east and one in the west. Mm-hmm. Transylvania on one side and uh, the Pyrenees. Yep. So Constantinople, right in the middle. Yeah. So you know we've got this. Uh, this crazy milieu of... Oh, there's that word. Yes, I, 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 I knew you guys would like that. Uh, then he manages to unite eventually, which is just a phenomenal task in and of itself. Into a... Single polity. That's good. What's the other word? Hegemony? Hegemony, yes, yes, right. yes, 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 excellent. Yes, uh, yes. There we go. I, we, I, I, I didn't have enough syllables. I knew, I knew talking Charlemagne, we had to get hegemony in there uh-huh. somewhere. Well, that's, you're exactly right. Two ten dollar words. Roll with it, brother, roll with yes, it. Talk about good. hegemony a little bit. Uh, well, it's just it's that very thing. It's that he's the power, he's and, the unity, and he's got the whole, you know. That's right. Whole, as, as you like to say, as Bella Oxmix says, uh-huh. I am the unity. Yeah, I got to be the unity. That's yeah. right. Uh-huh. Uh, and you know, he was he was also interesting because he he's not like you said he's not a conqueror. And he already has his own power base. He is a legitimate king, descended from kings, uh-huh. uh, which makes it uh, probably. Better in the eyes of many. So you know, we look at uh, the, the the raiding Goth armies that come in from uh, Northern Europe or from the other side of the Europe. The steppes and, and places the steppes like that. Yeah, you, they're all seen as warlords. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, marauding bands. Those of, who have taken what they want by force. Yes, and it's not to say that a king doesn't do that too. But I think in Europe you're gonna they're gonna view that a little bit differently because he's got his own kingdom. He is Frankish. Yeah. Yeah, and he is of the people. He is of them. And that's the ethnicity does matter because it, like it you does, say yeah. uh otherwise your your invaders from the north. Well no, no, he, he is of us and he is very uh very powerful in, in many respects, uh, that he's able to uh and enlightened, you know. I think Hobbes would have had a field day. I don't know if he spoke on Charlemagne in particular, but that whole enlightened despotism that he that he spoke of in Leviathan, which we've talked about, Charlemagne would be prototypical of that for him. He's one of those that did that well. Uh, and kind of looking back on that, he would say, see, Charlemagne makes this work. He is an absolute ruler, but he also recognizes there is diversity and a necessity of everybody getting along within here, because even though he is, I don't want to say rabidly Christian, he's certainly strongly so, uh, as a general rule, there were not religious persecutions under his time. Uh, he, uh, he, he wants to convert you, and if you, if you really make a stink, he might execute you, but that's not what he's working off of. That's not his model. It's not conversion at the point of a sword. And I, I wish I had it in front of me if he had any Jewish, anti-Jewish pogroms during his reign, but I seem to recall no. 
I'm willing to be because corrected. Because reign was so long, if that would be a if he said yeah, well, there were absolutely none. Yeah, but they, they were, there was none of his, that were sponsored by him. It was none of his well, stuff. Well, if you think about it at the time, it would be more likely he would be taking Jews in because they would be fleeing Spain. Well, that's, that's correct. True. That's right. Although uh, eventually, you know, not to you know, Al Andalus is a complicated political it, yes. entity. They were as a, far more friendly to, to Jews, Jews and, and than Christians. Many Christian uh, kingdoms would have been. But not all of them stayed. Some right. Some were secret, you know, secretly uh, did not convert after saying they did, which was a problem once the Christians took over. They were you know, secret Jews. Yeah, it really got difficult, to be honest, when uh, Ferdinand and Isabella went back and did. got it. But during so, the time, Alanos was very tolerant as a general rule. If you pay your taxes... Well, and, that's very important to a king. Yeah, that's right. And, and you... And you don't start killing people, and you, you know you get along with people. We'll probably allow you to do what you want to do. Well, as a Christian, you had to pay extra taxes. Though. That's correct. That's yes. right. There's there there's costs with this. Absolutely, but you do have to submit. I mean, they are. It was it was basically they they ran a market study <laughs> and came up with what was expected and reasonable, and yeah, it it it, it worked out. So uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, actually some of his ancestors because okay. uh, I think that's interesting too. Because, you know, we're talking about, uh, oh, yeah, you know what, this is a good point. Martin has just pointed out that we're a half hour into this episode. And a half hour is when we like to do what we like to call the bourbon break. It's like the bourbon. Yes, uh, bourbon. yes since we are talking about the... the talking French? Although they are much later. Much later, that's right. But, you know, say, hey. You're only a thousand years later, the last one is king. That's right, so, exactly. Yes, that is quite some time. So, uh, we are doing um, a couple of different ones from the last episode. Uh, Francis and I have poured uh, the old Forester 1920. Prohibition style. Yes, yes. It's 115 proof. Yes, so we just also tasted at the Fraser of our bourbon experience that Robert brings brings forth. Yes, uh-huh. and that was, uh, we did that one neat, because that, that's how all the bourbon experience Well, yeah, that's how they, they, they want it to be. Are, yes. This is a very different experience because we're having the same bourbon over ice. Yes, so we've got and the ice melting, and I tell you what, um, it, it's phenomenal the difference it makes in this. It, it was already good, yeah. But being 115 proof, it's a little harsher. Uh, it's it's like hard to drink burn. that one neat because yeah. the last time we had featured it on the show, I had it neat and I had a headache for the rest of the day. Right. Whereas this is this, much different. Oh my gosh! It really it, like many of the ones. I think the best servants has that as we call it a bloom or an explosion of flavor. Right. And you really do get a, 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 a really a great sweet bloom in the mouth. Um, you know, a little bit of caramel, I think, comes through with this. A little vanilla uh, as well. And caramel and vanilla almost always go hand in hand. We found out that it was almost entirely from the, from the oak, uh, which I did not realize. Uh, and, you know, the, the degree of char and everything else. That 1920 is... is it's super complex is what I love about it. Yeah. Because you, you get... It's like the flavors are stacked almost. Yeah. Yes. And you get, there's some spice, but then there's sweet, and then there's the oak, you know, that kind of wonderful woodsy, but then, you know, caramel. And, I think and it's that 115 proof that makes it, you put it over ice, and you but you don't water it down. I mean, you technically you do. It water it down. It, it does, but technically, but it's it's so powerful, you don't lose a lot, when, of, that, a yes. lot of that power that comes with it, but it's moderated to the point where it's not overtly intense. Yeah. Uh, Martin, the way you put that in is, is really great, uh, that it's layered. Uh, I get that sweetness there right on the tongue immediately. Um, then it uh, gets a little bit more of that peppery uh, immediately after. And then that burn starts uh, kind of in the back of the mouth down through the, uh, uh, into the stomach. And we learned from Sam at the Fraser that the pepper flavor, uh, the peppery tones, are from the rye in the mash yes. bill. Uh-huh. The, the rye that, you know, as you play with the mash bill and you more wheat, more rye, whatever, mm-hmm. that, that's what brings that level, that peppery type flavor up. Um, so I had uh, a... A nice snoot of Francis's Yellowstone Select, which I like quite a bit. Yeah, and that is a good. It is a good yes. bourbon. It really is. Uh, it's mellow and sweet, also. Um, yes, it's a, it, from, judging from the what I saw in your glass, it looks a lot lighter in color. So this is very much a wheat bourbon, right? Well, it's probably not aged quite as long. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, I want to say when I've got the bottle right here, uh, Mr. Howard, uh, and it's less it proof. It's only ninety-three. 
But, Only. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, but it, it's higher than some, you know. It's, it's, uh, right, it is more of a, more of a honey rather than the mahogany. So it's not, I don't think it's aged quite as long as not in the barrel is on. Um, right, the longer in the barrel, the darker it's going to be, generally speaking. Right, yeah. But it's, it just... uh, it, I find it to also have a little bit of that stack of the flavors. Um, a, a touch of uh, a touch of brown sugar, um, and then a, a tiny bit of spice at the finish. Right, yeah. So it's the rye's a... not real high in the mash bill, yeah. but it's nice. I, the rye, I think, is fine, but, you know, honestly... Uh, too much rye is, is to me, it becomes overpowering. So when we were at your yeah. place the last time. Yes. Um, the bourbons that we did, the sec- the first one we had was had, must have had much more rye because it was very peppery. And to me, that just overshadowed the taste of the next bourbon. Yeah. And so I think if you're going to do one that has a lot of rye or can has that kind of... Because, you, have, you know, there's nothing wrong with mixing what bourbon you taste. Normally, I say don't mix your drinks unless it's bourbon. You know, then you can have different bourbons... Uh, not a problem. Yeah. Um, but, you know, usually it's how you don't mix bourbon and then go to wine and then to beer. Yeah. That, that's a bad effect. But um, this, uh, you know, you don't want that pepperiness to overpower what comes after. Right. Very generally, very, very generally, the higher the wheat in the mash bill, you're going to get a little more sweetness. So that's yes. where your sweet notes come from. And I find myself kind of preferring those weeded bourbons a little bit as opposed to the rye as which is more peppery rye. right yes. yes so as you as you you know bring that rye count up in the mash bill that's where your more of the pepper notes are going to come from right which you know there's nothing wrong with either flavor it's a personal preference of course like. yeah. uh, because rye rye whiskey rye bourbons are very popular of, yeah we've had plenty of peppery ones that we liked i just find myself right this minute yeah. And I say this all the time. My current favorite, or right this minute favorite, um, is that uh, Monk's Road Small Batch, which is more of a weeded. So well, next time, kind of two different. Sets next time we're back at your place, we'll all that's we've already yeah, got we a plan. Yeah, that's that. right, and it's ironic too because Basil Hayden, one of our go-to bourbons, always I had purchased. And you guys may not even remember. Uh, a couple years ago, I had purchased the rye version of it. Yes, I and you that. all didn't like it as much. There was nothing we wrong with it. To try it. No, we, well, it you might have. It was whiskey and not even really bourbon. But it, uh, well, well, you might have been a little snoot over that one, yes. but I know uh, Robert here and I did not uh, fail to partake. Okay. Probably, but I probably did not like it, because again, the rye, I'm not a huge fan of. That's, that's, and that's kind of where it went. The rye, the least likely, less likely I am to, to really uh, yeah. like it. Right. bring it into balance. Yes. Have, you know, uh, the, the sweetness... Work with the corn, have a little sweet from wheat, and then a pepper finish. Yes, a little bit of a pepper finish. This has the pepper rye. finish. Yeah. It does, but boy, it is smooth. It is it, smooth. It, 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 it just uh, rolls well, straight through. Once, Come, you, once, you, once you get the ice, once in you the, get the ice in yeah. it, that's right. Uh, it's not nearly as smooth. Oh yeah, it, it, it's it's it, the it, the burn content is heavy yes. if you drink it neat because that's the way we did it last time, and I think that was a mistake. Uh, yes. Nothing wrong with it. You can do it whichever way you prefer. But just learning, for me at least, put this nice, heavy, high-proof bourbon on ice, and wow, I think you're getting it as intended. Right, right. It's my, uh, it's my estimation. Right, yeah. I would love to have the expert master distiller from Old Forester on the program to ask him those questions. Yeah. One, one more quick shout-out before we move on. I want to yes. say another shout-out to our new uh, bourbon buddy, uh, Spraga. Spraga from NYC. Yep. Uh, I told you you were going to get some shout outs. Now you've gotten two in a row. Yeah. Well, she, so. she, she participated in the in the 1920 Old yes. Forester. Yes, yes, she did. Yes. She seemed like the Russell Reserve. Uh, yes, I think she did. Yes, yes. She, she did indicate that was uh, of the three that we tried, that was her well, favorite. You know, uh, of the three that we did, I, I really had a hard time choosing between the Russell Reserve and the, uh, the, the, the Old Forester. Oh, the Yeah. yeah. Uh, the 1920, it, it's great. But it would not be, you know, uh, my go-to out of the three. I would probably be more likely to really? do one of the others more often. Really? Mainly See? because it is such a powerful taste. Uh, I like a more subtle... Well, if, it, if you had it neat like we were testing it, I would agree with you. Yes. Now, but this, if, uh, this is far more enjoyable. Yeah, I, that's, but preferring it, if I'm going to have it at my home, I'm going to have it like we're drinking it right now. Yes. 
I'd bring uh, that 1920, and that's probably going to be my go-to these days. It's hard for me to say that because Basil Hayden, for a long time, was, and he is my ancestor. Yeah. Nevertheless, I think I might be converted. I and, think this old turkey always, you know. Yes, yeah, it's, it's another. Awesome. Oh, that's correct. And, we, and that, that 1920, that is that's an achievement to me. I mean, that, oh yes, really, I mean, really, yeah. old yeah. force knocked one way out of park. They did. I mean, I, I think the entire line of those uh, that that years. That's right. And we have not. We've only sampled two of those. Right. There are two others we have yet to do. So. Uh, my intention is by the time we come back here next yeah, time, I'll have I'll hopefully have all four of them, and maybe we can even do a little bit of a comparison amongst all four and come up with uh, just exactly how different they are, uh, which is the intention, of course. Yes. Yeah. And we have another special guest. Oh, oh yes, Oliver is here. Oliver, Oliver has been a very good boy. He's been a good boy. Yes, he has. I, I will admit that. Uh, Mrs. Francis will be over the moon to hear that when I tell her about that because oh, that. Yes, uh, he has he has it. kept completely quiet. You have not heard him. Uh, he's popped in and uh, uh, because both of these guys pay an enormous amount of attention to that sport little brat that he is. Well, Mrs. Francis does that. She spoils him constantly. And she has the audacity to complain that our eldest daughter spoils her dog too much. Uh, Mrs. Francis is a spoiler from the very beginning. She loves to spoil that dog. Uh, it's yeah. actually fun to watch, uh, yeah, as long as he behaves. Yeah, and he be- and he yeah, is learning to behave. Boy. He was a rescue dog. He had a little bit of a traumatic background. He was kept into uh, kept in kennels uh, almost twenty four hours a day for weeks at a time. So even though he he kind of likes having his own little space, he's skittish at times. So yeah. he's learned a lot uh, to be loved on like uh, like Martin is doing right now. That's kind of his whole thing. He doesn't even bark when the bo- he's just. He's beginning to get to the point where when the boys come, he doesn't bark, and that is a high praise for him. Yes. You know, uh, Middle Daughter's uh, new dog, Nemo, uh, he was a rescue as well. Uh, he had been returned to the shelter, which is very sad. Yeah, because that means he was unable to... Well... Or it, 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 he was perceived as unable to comply. Either that or the family just realized, eh, this is not for us. You know, it's too much work in you're, you're being kind, but yeah, that's good. It's very well, possible. Because, it's well, very the possible. one is more a slam against the people. The other is a slam against the dog. And it could be one or could the other. It could be one or the other, or probably a mix of both. Yeah. Now, he is, because I think because of this, he is very clingy. Well, he's this, got some Oliver has, has some separation s- anxiety. Well, yeah, oh, that's correct. He has a lot of that. He he will sit in Mrs. Francis's yes. face practically all the time, uh, yes. and it's well, just Nino's a thing. Well, also a cuddler. He loves to nap, and when he sleeps, he's got to be pressed up against you. Well, he's got to be touching. Doggies it's are not allowed that. to sleep in my bed. Uh, yes. Although rumor has had it that if I leave before Mrs. Francis does. Somebody slips into the bed unbeknownst to me. I've been told this by yes. a few spies I have in place that have told me of Yes, it would not admitted. surprise me. No, of course, of course yes. it wouldn't surprise you all. Uh, but yes, you know, it, it, it's very sad that Nemo was taken back. But, you know, he's he's gotten so comfortable spending time with he's the family. He's found his place now. It's like his own second house. He's found his place now. You know, he, and he just loves uh, touching and being up against it's, it's funny to watch him with Bosco. Yeah. Bosco d- does not like other animals, and especially to be touched. So, and of course, Nemo just wants to play. I mean, he's going to be two in February. Yeah, he's still a pup. Yeah, he just wants to play. And Bosco well, does. I think not. Oliver's three. He's probably coming up on three. We're not yeah, real sure. He's getting close to that point where he's going to realize, you know, naps are better than playing. He's, well, yeah, he's getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, another he's, year or two, and he'll be there. Yeah, well, there's some of that now because uh, we had uh, the daughters here over the weekend with their two dogs. And both of them, one of which is, well, both of them are a little bit spoiled, but one in particular is very, uh, very spoiled. And um, he would hide. He, he had enough of it. He'd go under the couch. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Bosco hides when Nemo comes. That's right. It's just, okay, nice to see you, but I need to be, I, left, I, alone I, I need to be left alone today. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Bosco, he's, he, Nemo's grown on him in the sense that it's like, okay, I realize this little twit's going to keep coming over. Fine. I'll go say hello. We'll chit chat, you know, by sniffing each other's butts. Oh, don't I have to do? God, you're not supposed to say that. Well, okay, what, you don't like it when I sniff your butt and say hello. Absolutely not. I can assure <laughs> you that is definitely not a good thing. Well, it's not like I'm asking you to sniff my butt. Oh, that ain't gonna happen. I'm damn sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we have veered into some, some strange territories. Yes, maybe we yeah, need to, yes. maybe we need to go back to the yeah. king of the uh, Franks. Yes. So while we're here, though, further. while we're here, because we forgot to do the toast the last time, yes. we must have a drink to 
Pope Emeritus. Oh, uh, Benedict the Benedict Sixteenth. That's correct. Who just yes, passed us? We, we, we mentioned his passing. As of as passed. of this recording, it's only a few days. Yes, so uh, by the time this comes out, it'll been uh, a few weeks, two, a little over two full weeks. Like yeah. That. So uh, yes, he was uh, a giant in. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, this past weekend, when we uh, at mass, when we talked about him, he spoke. We called him though he who spoke of God as love and taught us of the the power of hope, which yes. I thought was an extremely good and really on-the-nose way yes. of describing him in just a little pithy well, sentence. Well, yeah, I mean, his two encyclicals, that's what they were. That's exactly it. That's yeah. right. That's, and that's, and that's uh, you know, yeah. if, you're in the, if you're inside and you know that stuff, you get that at one level, but if you aren't, which, you know, most people, even in the pews, don't get that. No. They, rec- they recognized, oh, he was that, wasn't he? Yes. I think Benedict will go down as a doctor of the church eventually. I think that would I think be. He is the greatest theological mind of the 20th century, easily, and into obviously the into early, the 21st, yeah, early 21st. Uh, oh, he, I would he agree. Was a brilliant man, absolutely stunningly brilliant. He, and he got the depth, uh, and he made it understandable for yes. so many people. And uh, he was keenly aware of society and societal effects. Uh, he's the one that came up with dictator rel- dictatorship. A relativism, yeah, and you know, yeah. honestly, I, I think that speech where that came out—that was just prior to the uh, conclave. I think that propelled him over the edge in people's minds in those cardinals because he was—it yeah. was a brilliant observation. And it's not like he was politicking for the job because that was the last thing he wanted. He was looking forward to being able to retire from his his uh, his job at the the uh, pre- his, from the, for the con- congregation for the doctrine of the faith. faith that's right so that he could write his uh, magnum opus to just pull his thomas aquinas not that he considered himself an equal but to write his own summa right and which he, was he never able to well his his works jesus of nazareth that's as came close, close. As it came. yeah uh, but which it's, is it's still not everything one of he the, wanted to write uh, no, my lord, but he and he wrote so many other things that yes. were weird. Very prolific author, and I, I think uh, very likely he will one day be proclaimed a saint and then a doctor, because I think all doctors are saints. Yes. Uh, no doctors are martyrs, but all doctors are saints, yes. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, I what think he will, will, I think John Paul will probably end up being a doctor of the church for his theology of the body. Oh, and, well, and, and many other things he did, uh, just uh, Veritatis Splendor alone, my goodness. But anyway, we're sliding down yes, into but to, to Benedict XVI. Uh, you know, wonderful Pope. In my yes, res, requiat in pacem. Yes. And speaking of which. Okay, so uh, Charlemagne's uh, ancestors. Uh, we kind of were talking about Charlemagne as if uh, he conquered uh, 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 or incorporated That's good. all these tiny little cities and polities and what have you. That's not entirely true. Right. Uh, coming from a, uh, a kingdom, his ancestors were not uh, uninfluential. They, they, there was a great big... Uh, uh, this is a movement that had already begun... By the time he completes it. We, we tend to, in the backside of history, act like he just sprang whole cloth as something completely new and different. Right. And I point to probably his grandfather. Mm-hmm. Charles, of course, my, not my namesake, but we share the title, The Hammer. Yes. Charles Martel. Martel, that's correct, uh, yes. He was, uh, he and uh, Pepin, uh-huh. uh, who followed him, who was Charlemagne's father. His father, that's right. The three of them... Together, they laid the ground for, groundwork for everything that, that comes after the Holy Roman Empire. And that, I think, you know, has to be emphasized as well, because he's not, as you said, not somebody who just came out of nowhere, right? like a Napoleon kind of did in that sense. Well, you know, he's, he's a military man, but he has no rank in, the, in, in France until after the Revolution. You know, obviously, he has military rank, but he's not a noble. No, yeah, he's, so in that sense, yes. Well, he had to make himself such. <laughs> yeah, to make himself such, yes. yes. So he, he comes out of nowhere in that respect. Right. But as you said, Charlemagne is not a Bonaparte. No. And he's, he's, part, of, he's part of the system. Yes. He, he doesn't usurp the system. I mean, yes. Bonaparte was called a usurper, rightfully so, in many respects, even though they willingly gave him the authority. Uh, he was not of the system, whereas Charlemagne very much was. And... Uh, and Although we do want to point out the fact that he did not inherit a 
unified kingdom. No. Uh, in fact, when, when his father, Pepin, died, uh, his brother, Carloman, was actually given the lion's share. Charlemagne was older. He was the first. Uh, but they, they, he splits the kingdom up, kind of like King Lear does uh, in Shakespeare. Uh, and very common with the Carolingian... Well, but, and to be honest, well, he did it himself with his own kids. That's right, yeah. and which led to the the Germans being a, a thing. Ultimately, which ironically they do this out of love. Yes, that's, and that's, that's, we should point that out. fratricide. It is what's going on. That's right. They, they, Everybody's going to get a piece, but will they be happy with that piece? Well, that's the, that's what they can't control. Well, and the short sightedness is that well, if you do this, if everybody does this, you end up with three hundred. Voting members of the Holy Roman Empire, right, and so you end up diluting what you have built. So in a way, it's very far-sighted in the sense that he's trying to keep it from being uh, a dynastic of wars, yes. like in England that right. happens later with England. Um, but on the other hand, he's setting it up for uh, chaos and ultimate dissolution. Now, granted, it took a thousand years, right? I mean, the Holy Roman Empire was the thousand-year Reich. Well, well, yes, it was the first Reich. Reich. That's, yeah. I mean, that's what uh, that's what Hitler. Repro- you know, that's why the Third Reich was the third. The Holy Roman Empire was the first, and the, the Reich of the Second Reich was Bismarck, and uh, up to the war, and then of course the Third Reich itself. Right. And most people, most of us, don't get that. Right. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so you know, he obviously he laid the groundwork for something that was massively influential in the rest of European history. He is called the father of Europe. Charlemagne is. Uh, and, and, and if so, then Pepin is its grandfather, and Charles Martel is its great grandfather. Yeah, uh, which absolutely. And this was a time when those old, what would become old rivalries between political entities, didn't quite exist yet. Uh, this this predates. I mean, England is still a Saxon kingdom at this point. Yes. Uh, well, actually, five Saxon kingdoms uh, that 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 work with work with themselves. The Scots are their own thing as usual. And uh, <laughs> well, they're trying to be so again. Yeah. Just starting to have the Viking invasions. Oh, that's exactly which is which is just outside of it. As far as only a couple of years before the coronation. Right. Pa- pa- partially because. You have this powerful entity to your south that you cannot mess with. And if you saw the, the TV series The Vikings, the first few episodes, they talk about that. Mm-hmm. Is that you, you can't go south because they'll, they'll whoop your big butt. But you can go east to the Russians, which was somewhat successful. But what about west? And that first season of The Vikings was very good about that because there was a reason. We don't go west. We don't know where we're going to go out in the ocean. What are you talking about here? We're going to go east, fight the Russians, and get what we can. Which that was not an easy thing. Oh, the, well, they wouldn't have been called Russians at the time. Well, the yeah. Russ, the Russes, R U S, is uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the Rus individuals. Yeah, uh, they actually predate most of modern Europe as a political entity. But that's another well, story. Yes, that's a whole other thing too. So. And it's when we say the Rus, we don't mean Russia, the territory of Russia as we know it today. Well, no, it's mostly Kiev. Right. Is, is the, the Rus is really the Ukraine? It is really Ukraine? That's yes. right. Exactly. Because they were the great. That was his power base. That's like exa- the Kiev. That's exactly right. And leaving there to go to to found St. Petersburg, if you want to lay so ultimately, if you want to lay the blame for the war in Ukraine at anybody's feet, it's Peter the Great's fault for not uh, keeping the capital. He is somebody we probably ought to do uh, uh, an episode on. That would be a fascinating. That, yes, uh, it is. Uh, uh, we could do a lot on many uh, many of those Romanovs. Uh, because oh, yes. they were a fascinating dynasty. Well, yes, well, you know, like the Habsburgs, the That's Romanovs right. are, it's a huge impact on history. Yeah, we tend to judge them by their final czar, unfairly so. Yes. I mean, Peter the Great's called Peter the Great for a lot of good reasons. He was yes. an amazing, amazing yeah, individual. It's, yeah, they don't really usually give nicknames for failures, but I mean, Nicholas would be called Nicholas the Putz. <laughs> well, yes. a, a, a tragedy, a very, very a, a hor- well, horrific you know, tragedy. You can yeah. you can make the same argument about uh, Peter the Great's son, uh, Peter the whatever number he would have been, uh, who married Catherine, who became Catherine the Great, because yeah. she basically said, you know what, you're a jerk. Yeah, um, you're, a you're really just interested in one thing, and uh, that's not going to cut it here. That's right. And she took over. That's exactly right. Yeah. She's German. And yes, ger- yes, German. and it's uh, it, it, there's a fast. The dynasty of the Romanovs is a fascinating, fascinating study. If you get a chance, uh, there's a six part. It's actually in Russian, but it's subtitled. 
uh, port, uh, maybe it's four parts, uh, that you can find on most of your cable channels about the Romanovs. Uh, made in Russia, but it's brilliant. It absolutely goes in depth with all these characters, all the way from the original. I recommend The Great. Granted, it's humor and it's not exactly right history. But it's more accessible. Yeah. It's generally correct, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. But that's just Catherine, though. That's this. Yes, this that's covers this covers Catherine. all the, all all of the others. Uh, it is fascinating. Now, so, we, so okay, so you'll indulge me when that time comes. We'll do that one. Yes, yes. yes. In, in three years, when it's your time to be indulged again, okay, uh, we will let you do that. Uh, so, anyways, he establishes the Holy Roman Empire, yes, and and then upon his death, divides it into an east and a west. That's how we get France as a separate. Political uh, nation, entity, yeah. Uh, ultimately. Which, oddly enough, even though that was Charlemagne's power base, is not part of the Holy Roman Empire. No, it's not. It became its own thing. That's yes. right. It was, it, it, they, they, in fact, they became at odds, eventually. Very quickly. Yes. Very quickly, I think. Uh, it was the, the, the Germanies, and, and that side, it's basically Eastern, the Western Europe is East and West, portions of that. Yes. And that's, and those two are, are politically, uh, misaligned with each other, uh, at odds with each other, with the North and the South being kind of wherever it falls. I mean, they, they had no influence. You go so far North and they were their own thing. Ironically, of course, those Vikings decided that France has you know, got some nice stuff down here. Got some good uh, wines, uh, some pretty ladies. So, so a whole say. bunch of them, basically, many of them, uh, while they're fighting in England to try and get that good farmland, many of them come over to to France. And the, the TV series Vikings does a really good job about this, uh, even though they compress a few things they, and yeah, they, they take some liberties. They, they, they put a few pieces, they put under one individual things that happen to several, but... Essentially, it's still the same thing. You you come in and uh, France in the France in their typical way. When you show up at their door and try to take over Paris, they buy you off, and they get well. You know this land up here, you'll love. It's called Normandy. You know you can have that. And of course, eventually, it gets to the point where the Normans become the dominant power uh, by stealing French customs, French attitudes. French, all this sort of stuff, and melding it with their Viking ancestry to become the ones who eventually conquer England and meld yet again and create a new and a huge uh, chunk of uh, of Italy really? too. That's correct. Yeah, they they win both cases. You know, that's just a uh, the Darwinistic aspects of Europe are fascinating to follow when you take the strong but less and the decadent and put them together. Yeah. Uh, That's usually a recipe for disaster. But in this case, something grows out of those ashes because... uh, You know, it's interesting. uh, I'm going to be somewhat politically incorrect here. Um, It's interesting because your example of the Vikings is a great uh, 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 opportunity to point this out. So, it's not always (laughs) talk about whenever somebody gets conquered. You know, later on... When the uh, those who are feeling guilty because their ancestors conquered something, like, well, you know, we need to give the land back. Okay, okay. So let's first start. Let's go back in time a little bit. Does that mean Henry's going to give all of those churches, and in uh, or, or Charles is going to give all those churches and uh, monastic lands back to the Catholic Church? <laughs> uh, you know, are they going to give all of England back to the uh, anybody who has some Saxon blood? Mm-hmm. You know, are the Normans going to give it all back to the native French? Are the Scots and the Welsh going to be suddenly completely independent? Right. Well, the yeah. Scots might be. Yeah. Well, they they almost were. They almost, they almost were. were, but they decided eh, maybe this whole UK thing's not a bad deal. Uh, that which goes to show that you know we've kind of crossed the the metaphorical Rubicon on this. Yeah. Hey, you like that one? Uh, to say you know that's the ship has sailed. We're no longer. Well, we're, we're, we're more. Well, it could it could politically speaking, but. You know, we're stronger together than if, apart. If England had stayed in the European Union, European Union, it might have passed. That is a very interesting question. That is a very yeah. interesting what if. Yes. Uh, yes, and you know, the European Union, European Union itself uh, can be seen as an attempt to recreate Charlemagne's right. Very much so. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, not just Rome, because Rome really was, it was a Mediterranean power. Not a northern, Less so a northern Europe. Power. That that is correct, and that's uh, you know, a, it, it extended there, but it Rome itself 
in the West ended before it could truly Romanize. They were too ethnically the different when you get further north. They were just too different. Well, they didn't have time to assimilate them properly. Like well, that's what I'm saying. saying yeah, yeah. yeah. Rome itself ended a few more centuries, ended. perhaps. Yes, if Rome had not fallen in the West, uh, perhaps that you know things would have gone much differently uh, as far as incorporating those Germanic tribes into the empire. Yeah. Uh, so, because you know, Rome expanded by point of spear. Well, I mean, uh, the, the, they, they Gaul was a great example yeah. because you know Caesar, Gaul. Gaul. When Julius Caesar was there, they were as they were very much you know very more like Germanic tribes than they were Romans. By the time Rome falls, they are and Britain as well. They are thoroughly Romanized. Yes. Well, France, you know, the Franks, Gaul, mm-hmm. whichever term you choose to use, um, it is a sophisticated country. Yes. And it has been for, uh, you know, probably close to 1,500 years. And, you know, you look at the first universities, where are they? Paris. That's right. Paris is a cosmopolitan city. France itself is the eldest daughter of the church, primarily because of Charlemagne and his, right. his forebears, making that into a strong Christian nation that... Something that's carried forward... And expanded. That's part of his legacy that I don't I want to make sure we don't lose that as we come up on an hour here. The fact that France, the descendants of Charlemagne, those in power in France, no matter the dynasty, because there's a little back and forth on all this, of course, they all saw themselves as good sons and daughters of the church that will protect it at all costs. And this goes even after Martin Luther, because during the eighteen oh, hundreds. Especially after. Well yeah, because uh uh, Louis the Fourteenth, which we talked about in that episode, you know, he considered himself a defender of that church, and he styled himself, as did all the Bourbons, his most Catholic Majesty. Well, yes, and you know, Richelieu was he was both a uh, French patriot as well as a patriot of the church. That's right. Uh, in France, that is easily seen as synonymous. The same thing. And pre-Henry, it was seen the same as in, in England too. Yes. Although that, you know, but that all oh, you know. Another subject. That's a whole, whole, yeah. oh, whole other thing. Uh, and many of the royal houses that we think of in Europe are traced directly to Charlemagne. The Habsburgs, especially, they are direct descendants of Charlemagne. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, when they are in charge of the empire, this is literally a legitimate uh, thing. Now, granted, you start out uh, much smaller, much later, mm-hmm. uh, but they are a direct descendant. Uh, the was the House of Ivrea, uh, the House of, Lu- of Luxembourg, uh, the Atonian dynasty, and the Capetians. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you're a history buff, you're not going to recognize most of those. Right. So except maybe, well, unless you're a history buff, you're not going to recognize the Hofsburgs either, but uh, those are usually the most recognizable. Right. Um, and, and yet, you know, he is, he literally, in that sense, he literally is the father of Europe. Uh, not just because of the, the uniting, but because future rulers all descend from him and and try to and try to establish legitimacy accordingly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, yes. And, yeah. I mean, what you, you know, hanging your hat off of what he built gave you the chance to set up your whatever your region, county, duchy, whatever imperial city, whatever, yeah, whatever yeah. As, as a as an equal and sovereign place. Just like the And one thing I will point out, one last thing, because this is uh, something that touches on uh, Francis and I uh, quite a bit. Um, so, because the Pope crowns him as the Western, basically the, empire, the Emperor in the West is the, is the uh-huh. intention. And the intention is to elevate him above the Emperor in the East, because ultimately the goal was to reunite the halves of the Empire. Right. Uh, even though it's not really the same empire. Yeah, at this point, I mean, they were really trying to establish him as the legitimate heir to both halves. Right. Because there's a woman on the throne. Yes, I mean. Yeah, which is very, I mean, that's rare in any time, but yes. Um, and so, because of this preference for the Holy Roman Empire in the West, this ultimately, it doesn't cause, but it contributes to the Great Schism in 1054. Oh, yes. That's, it that's it right. is not just the Filioque. It is many things. Uh, you know, that's the religious reason. The political reason is 
began yeah, to begin yeah, to start. Yes. And all of a sudden, the East has to take notice of the West again. Before, they were simply a bunch of barbarians that we can defeat handily, and all of a sudden, it's Which like, is true. It's, it's right. And now, all of a sudden, they are as sophisticated, one could argue, as those in the East. Uh, and militarily uh, strained to be that's, that's, that's correct. Well, and with the, sophistication. Yeah, yes. well, and with the universities that the, that the church establishes and the... You know, which really, <coughs> if anything, brings the, the Europe out of the Dark Ages, is going to be that. Right. Uh, that's where learning flourishes and starts to expand. Uh, because of that, yes, there is sophisticated things. Some of the greatest thinkers of the Middle Ages absolutely are uh, products of that. That's right. Uh, but yeah, so it, he has a lot to be credited with as well as blamed for. Uh, yeah, we didn't talk about a lot of the blame for. Uh, we've we've run out of time. So yes. I know it's kind of been a little bit of a worship moment. Maybe you can do a uh, couple of blog posts on uh, the blame for stuff. Yeah, because uh, as with so many uh, uh, powerful figures, you know they they were complicated. They had some issues on that. Uh, mm-hmm. I resist the attempt to kind of look at him through mo- a modern lens too yes. much. Yes, I agree. Uh, uh, because the, that's that's a bit of a problem. Uh, uh, no question he was a powerful personality, though. We didn't talk much about that. I will end the episode, though, by saying this. If you really want to get to watch something about him, uh, we've there's very, very little... Uh, it's hard to capture him on film. However, in 1993, uh, in Europe, Christian Brendel starred in a four-part miniseries called Charlemagne. That you can find on YouTube, all four parts of it. Uh, it was uh, premiered in North America on the History Channel. I happened to tape that uh, when it happened uh, a few years after that. And it is yes, I think I have a copy you, of that. Yeah, you me. probably yes. remember that. It was. Yes. Uh, uh, it's in English. You know, it's dubbed, uh, and it's fantastically deep because you've got basically six hours. You know, four hour and a half episodes that go into him as a person and all the aspects that he did, uh, uh, where it's deep into his education, his personal life, his military conquests, and all the above, uh, and makes him very human and accessible. If you can, like I say, it's on YouTube, it's yeah. worth sitting down with and watching. Uh, it's, it's a powerful, it's probably the best testament of him. He's just too big to capture otherwise. Yeah. You need six hours. Well, he lived to be 72, and he was king for you know almost all of that. That's he right, exactly. And emperor for 14 time. of those years. Yes. Peacefully. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to cover in him, uh, and he is easily the largest figure of the Middle Ages. Period. Oh, was, absolutely. Yeah. He is bigger than any pope. Absolutely. Uh, who would probably be, at least in, in Europe, mm-hmm. the only potential rival for him. And he's bigger than any of them. That's right. So, if, so you, much if, later. if you want to really understand him as a person, I think that miniseries did a very good job uh, okay. of making him accessible, human, flaws and all, but uh, the power comes through, and I think that's essential. I think Robert's right. I think we need some blog posts from Francis. I've been kind of holding the blog up on my own here. So yes, you have. Some Martin Thursdays. All right, all right. Martin Saturday. All right. Martin Saturday. Well, I, I can assure you that I can easily post some stuff with some references to the miniseries on YouTube. I, I like you know putting those in there. Hey, if you push me, maybe I can do a four-part. Oh, uh, I'm pushing. Let's okay. Have some, Let's have a four-part posting. missing Francis. We right. need some Francis. We'll do a four-part. We need some, some Robert. Too, a a four-part Charlemagne thing where I can re- reference, uh, link back to each of the four parts and talk about what they were doing. That would be uh, excellent. He, he deserves oh, that. Yes. He deserves yeah, that. Yeah, no, he's uh, uh, in, in just an, a little over an hour. There's no way we can do Charlemagne justice, yeah, for goodness that's sakes. That's a, a, a teaser. focused thing. All right, all right. That's fine. fine. Mark's not capable you talked me into it. Okay, uh, here in this new year, uh, look for that in the coming weeks. All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So okay. on that note, Francis, buddy, what's next? A uh, code of honor. Now, uh, this is a freewheeling code of honor. You know, right. no know, theme this time. No First theme time this time. In several months we've not. Had oh, a that's theme. right. Yeah, well, we did our philosophy run through, which is one of the things I'm most proudest of that we did so much about. We would learn the philosopher and then we talk with their quotations. All that's finished now. Yep. So we uh, the chains have been taken off. The training wheels are off. We can pull whoever we want. I'm not sure we can remember how to do this. Actually, guys. Well, you know, uh, one of my sources I left at home. So, uh, uh, so you really are winging this one yes, here. Yes, I am. Totally so uh, figure out what Robert comes up with as he hammers these things together next episode.
Hope you enjoyed another pointless discussion of eternal questions. Remember, new episodes drop every second and fourth Friday at 6 a.m. Eastern. Spread the word. We're on all the major podcast platforms. And leave us a review. That helps others find us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website, snakesandotters.com. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Join us next time.